Hello everyone, this is Jeffrey Logan from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Today we're going to hear the second lecture on the subject of demand side management and here we'll be focusing on policy options. Um, this lecture will build off of some of the concepts that were introduced in the first lecture. So here we will reintroduce the idea of building blocks of demand side management. And in the figure, you can see that there are six of these, starting with legislation and capacity building, outreach, delivery, financing, and evaluation. And for each of the building blocks, there are a number of different stakeholders that typically participate. For example, in the legislation building block, we have governments and nonprofits or NGOs that are typically involved in that building block. Uh, and in evaluation, for example, we often have academia, government, utilities, and again, nonprofits or NGOs. So we will go into more detail in each one of these building blocks in the coming slides. Now, one of the most direct ways to promote a demand side management policy is through a legislative or regulatory target. And we're going to talk about three examples of targets here in this slide. We begin with uh, what in the United States we call an energy efficiency resource standard or in Europe, they often call an energy efficiency obligation. So what is an energy efficiency resource standard? It's a quantifiable long-term target for utilities to achieve measured as a percent of load. So they might be required, for example, to um, save 2% of the load each year through the energy efficiency resource standards. Uh, and savings are typically through customer end use programs that are managed by a utility or a third party provider. And utilities may already have a demand side management program uh, in existence, and that could be folded into the EERS target without too much difficulty. Uh, the, these targets may also have a peak load reduction components to them. So that applies more directly to the demand response uh, part of DSM. Uh, some of the variables that legislators or regula le regulators can work with when designing an EERS include whether it's voluntary or mandatory, uh, how stringent the target is, and what penalties might exist if they are not met, um, who, who will evaluate the um, accuracy of the EERS reports? And then whether or not there might be any spending restrictions, for example, on, for example, 50% um, of the EERS might, must be met through low and moderate income households, for example. So that's the energy efficiency resource standard. And I have a list of um, further readings at the end of the slide deck if you want to get more specific information on how to design any of these policy um, mechanisms that we're discussing today. A second example uh, might be energy storage targets. And there are a number of states in the US that have set uh, energy storage targets in order to advance their demand side management programs to improve the flexibility of their power grids and to help integrate variable sources of renewable electricity. And like the EERS, uh, an energy storage target is usually uh, set through a legislative or a regulatory measure. So in the United States, we many states have energy storage targets, but there is no central government uh, target. 
And typically what happens in a U.S. state is that the state legislature will pass an energy storage target and then the state regulator will be in charge of implementing it and actually doing the fine details. Um, utilities or distribution system operators are typically held responsible for energy storage targets. And like the EERS, there are some key policy variables for energy storage targets. For example, the amount and duration of storage required and what type it is. Is it battery storage or is it pumped storage hydro or some other mechanism? So then finally, a third type of legislative target uh, to promote demand side management is seen in what are called minimum energy performance standards or MEPS. There are many different terms uh, um, that can be used in place of minimum energy performance standards, but they all basically define maximum levels of energy consumption for appliances or equipment per the unit of service delivered, such as an example would be a, a light bulb must um, deliver at least 45 lumens of light per watt of electricity consumed. In the DSM supply chain is capacity building and outreach. Some examples of capacity building and outreach include green labeling programs that attempt to inform consumers about proven high efficiency products, and they often focus on the life cycle costs of an appliance, for example. Uh, and these life cycle costs include not just the purchased investment, but the annual operating costs. So you might see a consumer, for example, shopping for a refrigerator and wanting to pick a refrigerator that cost, let's just say, $500 instead of the one next to it that cost $550. And the green labeling program would show that even though the one on the left hand side at $500 is cheaper, if you add the, the annual operating costs in, it might turn out that um, the refrigerator on the right uses $50 less energy each year than the cheaper one. So very quickly, you, you'd see that there's only a one year payback in the refrigerator on the right. And after that time, the consumer would be saving more and more money each year. So that's one example of a green labeling program. And it's important to note that uh, green labeling programs uh, needed to be updated regularly and focus on uh, the behavioral drivers that influence consumers purchasing. Uh, another example of capacity building is training energy auditors. And we know that uh, utilities, for example, or third party companies often can conduct energy audits and try to prioritize investments that the building owner can take to reduce energy demand. And there's a growing level of sophistication that both utilities and third party employees can use when conducting these energy audits. So the trainings are attempting to bring them up to state-of-the-art knowledge in conducting such audits. Um, and it's also important to note that training of auditors should be both sector and geographically specific. And so, for example, the geographically specific um, part of this is important because in a cold climate, an energy auditor would be looking for ways to reduce uh, the energy transfer out of the building during cold winter months, and that would save uh, a lot on the heating bills. On the other hand, uh, in, a, in a very hot climate, um, the auditor might be more um, uh, specifically trained in the HVAC system, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And that's maybe where you would get more energy savings by having a, a more efficient air conditioning device. Uh, a third type of
capacity building is and outreach is uh, delivered through schools in their curriculums. And uh, the goal here is to design age appropriate curriculum for students and focusing on most important residential and commercial demand side management subjects. We know that in a lot of households uh, where the parents have limited education, the children are effective providers of in information that can influence how their parents behave. So uh, using school curriculums to deliver demand side management uh, lessons can be an important driver. Uh, finally, um, using outreach, you can target special uh, or um, um, certain segments of the population that might otherwise be typically hard to reach. And these might include low income citizens or elderly or those who speak uh, a language that is not uh, maybe the national mother tongue. And it's important that special outreach programs are designed to target these specific audiences. And you need a diverse outreach program uh, in order to um, um, contact these populations. Uh, often, um, locally um, available NGOs or not for profits um, can be used because they are trusted by the local residents more than, uh, for example, a utility might be. It is what we call delivery and installation. This is sort of the brick and mortar part of the demand side management. Often um, we see utilities uh, involved in the delivery and installation uh, process. And one example of that is seen in bulk purchasing programs. So utilities are sometimes able to enjoy economies of scale by purchasing uh, usually low cost devices at, in very large quantities. And some examples of this might be light emitting diode light bulbs or low flow faucet aerators for your sink. And especially what's important about a low flow faucet aerator is that it reduces the amount of hot water that you uh, might otherwise use and saves energy. So utilities can do this bulk purchasing and either distribute them to customers for free or at a reduced cost. And these kinds of activities can allow the utility to defer investments in new generation or new transmission. And at the same time, utilities might want to make these investments because it helps add to their rate base and it improves the amount of revenue that they're receiving. So policymakers might need to uh, uh, enact regulations that would encourage the utility to minimize the investments in new generation or transmission. And there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, another example of a company that uh, focuses on delivery and installation is an energy service company. So these are typically private companies. In some countries, they're public. Uh, they combine both engineering and financial expertise. And they would often they will often go to an industrial facility or a commercial building and do an energy audit and then tell the owner uh, what priority investments it would recommend to save energy costs each month. And then the ESCO, under many circumstances, will finance those investments for the industry or building owner. And over time, it will share the energy savings each month with the industry or the commercial building owner. And that way the ESCO gets paid back 
And after a certain number of years, whatever new equipment was paid for by the ESCO will just be handed over in ownership to the industry or building owner. So both sides um, uh, benefit under this kind of um, transaction. One thing to note is that in some countries, you may need to enact enabling legislation to allow ESCOs to exist because they basically finance and pay for the new equipment that's being installed at the industrial facility or the commercial building, they can be um, unintentionally classified as banks. And unless they meet a, a, a lot of regulatory um, requirements, um, they do not want to be labeled as banks because the bureaucracy is just too difficult for them to deal with, given that they're in the business to save energy, not to loan money like a bank would. Uh, a third example of delivery and installation is weatherization. And this is often done by a combination of utilities and not-for-profit companies and also local energy uh, offices in a, in a region. Um, and weatherization is important because often uh, low-income consumers are given subsidies each year to help pay for their heating or cooling costs. And while it's important to um, look out for our low income customers, over the long term, it's more effective to invest in fixing the building envelope than it is to paying annual subsidies for their heating and cooling costs. It's just, it's just a better long-term outcome if, if it can be achieved. So again, we use an energy audit uh, when we're doing a weatherization project. And we use a cost benefit test and we figure out which investments are, uh, which ones pencil out and which ones are profitable and which ones are not. So you might decide after doing an energy audit that you want to install more insulation in the roof, but that installing new windows would not be a cost effective uh, investment. Uh, one of the, the important um, challenges of weatherization is um, coming up with uh, a revenue stream each year to support it. And if it's paid for out of the general revenue fund that the government has, uh, it may often get cut or be challenged, especially if economic conditions are challenging. So if you can design a way to permanently or annually fund the weatherization project, uh, that's, that's a real benefit. And one way to do that is to enact a wires charge or what's also known as a systems benefit charge so that for every kilowatt hour of electricity that's sold throughout the system, each customer has a very small incremental amount added to that. And then all of those funds are aggregated and pooled into a special fund where um, the weatherization program can be supported. Finally, utilities can use tariffs uh, as a way to uh, influence the way consumers use electricity. Um, traditionally, consumers, at least residential and commercial consumers, had very static tariffs, uh, but now we're seeing more use of dynamic tariffs, including uh, time of use tariffs, uh, real-time pricing of electricity, and other ways to guide consumers for when it is best to use electricity and when it is not. Um, one example of how to finance a, a demand side management project, especially an energy efficiency project, is for a utility to use what's called on-bill financing. And in this case, the local utility will pay for the energy efficiency upgrade um, and then charge the consumer uh, or the ratepayer 
um, a small amount each month on their bill. This is a small adder in addition to whatever normal energy charges the customer would receive. Uh, this can be done for residential, commercial, and industrial users. Um, again, uh, we mentioned um, on a previous building block the role of energy service companies and their role in financing upgrades at industrial facilities and commercial buildings. Um, a third type of uh, financing uh, is focused on government directed taxpayer funds. And in, under this uh, mechanism, legislators can decide to dedicate general revenue funds to support demand side activities. And as we noted on an earlier slide, this is sometimes an uncertain way to finance and fund your demand side management programs. If there's ever an economic downturn or a shortage of, of revenue, uh, certain legislators will immediately go after those uh, funds dedicated to demand side management to support some other pet project that they have. So uh, we, we also learned that a wires charge is a good way to prevent uh, the pilfering of money that might otherwise be spent on demand side management. And we described that the wires charge uh, is a small adder that's put onto each kilowatt hour that's sold. And it goes into a, a pool or a fund that is dedicated to um, whatever it is you design, but uh, demand side management is, is often one of them. And a wires charge often requires either regulatory approval so that the utility can do can uh, enact it or it requires legislative approval. Okay, now we move to the last building block in our set of policy options, and that's evaluation. Uh, sometimes evaluation is referred to as E, M, and V for evaluation, measurement, and verification. There are many, many different ways you can evaluate a DSM program or project, um, and we're not going to get into much detail here, but again, there's additional reading at the end of this slide deck if you're interested. So demand side management programs must be evaluated at periodic intervals. This is to ensure that the utility or whatever, uh, whatever third party uh, agency is implementing the demand side management project is actually doing what they say they are doing. In other words, if there's a energy efficiency resource standard in effect and they need to demonstrate that they've cut energy demand by 2% each reporting period, then the evaluation will verify that that in fact has happened. Evaluation is not an afterthought, but it should be incorporated into the beginning of any DSM program. By doing so, you not only identify what types of data you're going to need, but you also help to formulate clear and achievable um, objectives and program goals. Knowing that at the end you're going to be you're going to have to prove something makes you smarter in how you design it. And then for evaluations to be valuable, they must be SMART. Uh, and SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Timely. Evaluations will target a subset of DSM program participants and estimate both their energy savings and non-energy benefits. You can use statistical methods if you pick the right subset of participants to make generalizations about the entire population. Uh, evaluations are often conducted by academics or by NGOs, and some of the methodologies can be very complicated and very um, detail-oriented. Uh, there's two main types of evaluation. One is verification, where the third party evaluator will go in and 
make measurements or estimates of how much energy the new equipment is using compared to what it used to use and then estimating what the overall savings might be. Uh, another broad category of evaluation is referred to as documentation. And this is when you cannot go in and make measurements or um, informed estimates about how much energy was actually saved. And you instead document what the reported changes were and make calculations based on what you were told. So it's a little bit more a little less rigorous than the verification process. It shows all the building blocks um, stretched out next to each other. And while it may seem intimidating to start a demand side management program, you should always keep in mind that you can begin modestly with, for example, just a piece of legislation that has a, a target for achieving a certain amount of energy efficiency or demand response, for example. And then as you get more and more experience and as your institutional capacity grows, you can link together these um, building blocks in ways that provide more, greater and greater levels of effectiveness. So here, you know, you can see how this chain evolves and how impact grows as the level of institutional capacity expands. So start modest and improve over time. So in summary, what are the key takeaways from lecture number two on demand side management? First, demand side management is an integral part of modeling and forecasting demand growth. Earlier lectures in the series talked about how forecasting demand growth can be complicated and DSM can certainly make that even more complicated, but it's essential to take it into account when you're forecasting future growth. Second, a variety of measures are available to promote demand side management objectives that go beyond simple legislative and regulatory measures. Third, stakeholders can start with relatively simple measures like targets or bulk purchasing by utilities and move to more complex activities like ESCOs or dynamic tariffs, depending on the institutional capacity. Special outreach efforts may be needed to reach and influence certain members of the DSM user base. We noted earlier that some households uh, may have language differences or educational differences that require special outreach efforts to um, make them aware of the benefits of demand side management. Fifth, designing demand side management programs with durable funding sources can be achieved through a wires charge that most utility customers contribute to. Low income customers, of course, can be excluded as this would be a burden on them. Finally, evaluation is a critical step in any successful demand side management program. It is not an afterthought, but helps to define initial objectives and desired impacts. Thank you very much. Here's a list of further reading on the general subject of demand side management. And here's a list of further reading on setting targets, capacity building, outreach and education, finance, and finally evaluation. Thank you very much and good luck with your demand side management programs.